But we do have the third part of the examination of what happened with Peter in Galatians 1 and 2. Likely the final part. And in this, in this lesson, we are looking at the question of who, which is really <clears throat> where the rubber hits the road. It's about people. What's happening in Galatians 1 and 2 is that Paul can look back at what happened in Acts 15 and at what happened when Peter completely turned his back on Acts 15 and acted like the Gentiles were not acceptable. He can look back, Paul can, when he writes the letter to Galatia, and he can see that hypocrisy had been there the whole time. That's what's really, really happening. There's not another one after this one, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if we look at why the Pharisees or, or why the why the circumcision were so scary. But this is the real real here, down to it. What really is happening, and the reason Paul is able to structure the first chapter as the outline for the second chapter, to stick Peter in there as the one who like an angel from heaven preached the gospel contrary and should have been allowed, should have been uh, uh, treated as accursed, right? He had that structure in mind because he could see in retrospect that the hypocrisy had been there all along. Now, he's, he's covering this in the second chapter with this concept of influential pillars, and Paul makes a real fine point of influential pillars as we look at these verses in chapter 2 that feature it, uh, uh, chapter 2 of Galatians. And we ought to listen to that. When he says this and he repeats this, there's a reason. And we need to pay attention to it. But one thing that I think is important about this that he's trying to get across is that it's wise to be careful how you treat influential pillars. But that it's also necessary to treat them nonetheless. You have there in Galatians 2, uh, when he went to Jerusalem because God told him to, he set this gospel before them privately before those who seemed influential. And when you look at the sixth verse, he refers back to those who seemed to be influential, who didn't add anything to him, you know, didn't change the teaching, but they seemed to be influential. Paul understood there was such a thing as seeming to be something. You know, seeming to be pillars, seeming to be influential. There are some people who are esteemed, who are revered, and dare we say, who are above question. Should it be that way? No, it shouldn't, but they are. You find this out when you question one of them. <laughs> That's just how that's going to work out. But it's true there are people who are esteemed, and you know, maybe esteem is valid, who are revered because of the good they have done in our lives. That might be true and that might be good. But very often they become above question, and that's never good. Nobody is above question. That's one of the first things that Paul is trying to get across here. Nobody is above question. It's wise to be thoughtful about how you're going to do this because they are considered influential. They are revered. They are held in esteem. And that's going to be hard for people to take. But 
you do have to treat it. You can't just look the other way. Who are these influential? Who are these pillars? Well, Galatians 2.9 identifies them by name. James, Cephas, and John, who seem to be pillars, gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me. So you have three apostles by name who seem to be pillars. They seem to have something to do with this. Certainly, we have a record of James and Cephas, that's Peter, speaking up in Acts 15. And we've gone over enough detail, I think, in Acts 15 to see that what they taught there is very different from what they're doing here. But you see, they're all entangled, is what we're saying. This is a mess. They've all gotten in, implicated in it. And in, G in Galatians 2.12, he talks about the fact that Peter was eating with the Gentiles until certain men came from James. Look at that influence. Does it mean nothing that they came from James? No. It clearly is a trigger. They're from Judea. You know, they're different. <laughs> you shouldn't have party manners, right? That's what we're saying. In the church, there shouldn't be any such thing as party manners. Everybody is important. Honesty is the rule of the day for every Christian. But look at the power of influence. You know, Peter, by doing this thing that he did, led others astray. Actually, it says the rest of them in the 13th verse of Galatians 2. The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with Peter so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Even Barnabas. Why even Barnabas? Why is that so hard? Well, there's some specific reasons for this. But mainly... It's things like the record of Acts 4. When you first meet Barnabas and the apostles give him a nickname, Acts 4, 36 and 37, Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. He was a Levite, a teaching priest who obeyed the gospel and sold his possessions and gave them to the Lord to be distributed to those who had need in Jerusalem. He was leaving Cyprus. He was going to live there. And the apostles called him Barnabas. That name means son of encouragement. He was an encourager. He was such an encouragement that he got a nickname. <laughs> Nicknames, that, that's, you know, it doesn't get any more bro than that. They like this guy. <laughs> He's such an encouragement. And when Paul obeyed the gospel in Acts 9, he had been on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. So when he obeyed the gospel, not everybody believed that he was trustworthy and should be allowed. So who ushers Paul into the church? But Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Acts 9.26, when Paul had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they didn't believe that he was a disciple. But, verse 27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and now at Damascus, he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. It was Barnabas who had made it possible for Paul to have an audience in Judea. They knew about his teaching, and they knew about him because Barnabas stood up for him. Barnabas heard him preaching, heard the truth that he was proclaiming, and he stood up for Paul that's the only reason that he was able to be acceptable to the apostles in Jerusalem. 
So even Barnabas was led astray as to say, this guy who knew the Bible like the back of his hand, he was a teaching priest and he became a Christian. He is the scribe who obeys the gospel that Jesus talked about, who brings out of his house treasures, something old and something new. It's this guy. He's such an encouragement that he grabs Paul and takes him in. They were afraid. But this guy can be led astray by what Peter did. And he was. That's the power of influence, you see. It was good and it was bad, but it's powerful. And that's the point. The pillars of, of uh, the influential pillars is to say that there is such a thing as influence and it is powerful. But as we said, it's clear that Paul is looking back in, in, in his retrospective, he realizes this had been there. And we notice how convenient it is at Galatians 2, 9, that the agreement was this. When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. How convenient. Don't you think? You say, well, no, uh, clearly the apostles had been told, hmm, it sounds legit at the time. Because Paul had, was out there and he was preaching. And they were back here in Jerusalem and they were preaching. And, you know, that sounds legit at the time, doesn't it? But in retrospect, isn't that convenient that Paul did this and Paul went to them and that, that, that'll, that'll just be fine. That'll just be fine. Is separate but equal a valid tenet for the church? I don't believe that it is. I don't think you can find a scripture one that supports the idea that brethren of you know in in the same nation shouldn't meet together if they have different cultural backgrounds a lot of people thought that that was true oh there ought to be whatever there ought to be black churches you know they need to have their thing over there you know huh? no they're just christians like anybody else you need to have the, the, the Spanish brethren, as they call it, who none of them are Spanish. <laughs> they're, they're all from Latin America, <laughs> but they do speak Spanish. Well, sometimes it's true that people don't speak the same language and they're going to have to do something about that. Okay. But why is it that the overwhelming majority of the members of those churches speak English? Why then don't they meet? with the Anglo Church, as they call it. If you didn't know that, by the way, this is the Anglo Church. Yeah. Why not? Well, it sounded legit at the time, but in retrospect, boy, that was convenient, wasn't it? Hmm. In Galatians 2.10, he said, well, the only thing that they put on us was to remember the poor, which was something I was quite eager to do anyway. But to remember the poor, what is this? This is about the famine that befalls Jerusalem. Well, Judea, the environs. The famine that happens there, and they do have a real famine, and they are in real need. And there's plenty of record in Scripture of various churches contributing towards the needs of the saints in Jerusalem, and they even sent it by the hand of Paul back to Jerusalem. The only thing that they wanted was to make sure that we remember the poor. Okay. In Acts 15. But you know, that's not a two-way street. You see in... Well, in the book of the Acts, the record shows in the 16th chapter, the 17th chapter, 18th, 19th, 20th, 
that Paul began this journey into the Greek-speaking um, countries along the shore of the Mediterranean, you know, going through Philippi, Macedonia, going through Macedonia into Greece, into Athens, right, up to Ephesus, all that kind of stuff happening. And as he went, he told them about the prophecy of the uh, famine in Jerusalem. And he spread that, and you see the record of it, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, you know, lots of places where he's talking to them about the contribution to the needs of the saints. Romans 16 talks about it. Lots of places. That's not in dispute. But remember in Philippians 4, when Paul was being uh, uh, thankful to them because they sent him monetary support from Philippi, the brethren in Macedonia, that they supported him. Remember in 2 Corinthians, when he was at Corinth and was in need, he burdened nobody at Corinth. The brothers from Macedonia supplied his need. Philippi, they did that. Remember in Philippians 4, when Paul wrote to Philippi about this, thanking them on the one hand, commending them on the other hand, we get a detail there. In the 15th verse of Philippians 4, you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Why didn't he have support from Jerusalem to go to the Gentiles? The church with what was it, 30,000 members? Last time we looked in Acts 5, Acts 6. Why didn't they support Paul? You remember us. But are we going to send you? <laughs> Don't call us, we'll call you. You see how that works? They're the ones who are up. They're the ones who are above. You answer to them. Convenient. And of course, Peter in Galatians 2.12 was eating with the Gentiles until certain men from James came. And when they came, then he drew back and separated himself. Was not eating with the Gentiles anymore. Well, you know. Is there a verse in the Bible that tells me what table I have to sit at? You know, Peter, or Paul, you're, you're so mad at him, and all he did was sit at the wrong table. Right? That's what they'll do. That's not true, of course. It obviously means something else, doesn't it? But he thought it was okay, and this is what people will do. Well, you can't be against Bible study. I'm like, no, I'm not against Bible study. I'm against you teaching error. Right? It's always switching something out, something innocuous, something harmless, it seems, or, or at least controversial. Like, well, you know, I mean, where he sits, you know, they were, they were new in town. He was being hospitable. Right, all this kind of stuff. But no, that's not what was happening. This is what was happening. It was hypocrisy. That's what Paul is seeing. In retrospect, they were hiding this attitude for a long time. That's what he's getting at. And it explains why Galatia has such a problem here. It had been settled in Acts 15. It had been resettled with the events relayed to us by Galatians 2 when he rebuked Peter. But Galatia still has a problem. Why do they still have a problem? It's because it was really, really entrenched. It had always been there. It had been there the whole time. That's what he's realizing. And so it's coming down to who? This is the rest of the letter. It's coming down to who?
the fact is that, you know, the gospel is personal. You're going to have to take it personally. That's just the way this is. Remember Galatians 1, 8 and 9, even if we or an angel from heaven preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached already, let him be accursed. If anyone among you is preaching a gospel contrary, let him be accursed. Who has authority in the gospel? No man, no man, no apostle, no angel. Not the apostles, not the heavenly vision. Nobody can contradict the gospel and retain authority in God. Who gave this gospel? <laughs> Whose is this anyway? Where did it come from, right? Galatians 1. 11 and 12, he said, I'd have you know, brothers, the gospel preached by me is not man's gospel. I didn't receive it from man, nor was I taught it. I received it directly through a revelation of Jesus Christ. 15 to 17, when he who had set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone else, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. And the 21st verse I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Who gave this gospel? God gave this gospel. This establishes the divine origin of the gospel. Unlike the rest of the church, everybody at Galatia, Paul wasn't taught the gospel by anybody else. He received it directly from the Lord the way the apostles had done. He's not subservient to the apostles. There's no subject, uh, sub, uh, succession of uh, apostleship. Like he's the next wave or the second tier or the second generation. Nah, uh, no. Look who's not the source of this gospel. It's not man's gospel. It's not the apostles who were before him. It's not the churches of Judea. Even though the gospel was given by the Jews, that's true. Everybody who preached it was Jewish, that's true. It was not theirs, it was God's. And who's responsible for all of these people being led astray? Galatians 2.14 I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? This you, it's you individually, you Peter. This is very pointedly personal. Peter is being called out by name, and that's what has to happen sometimes. We need to name names. You have to. Otherwise, people won't take it personally. They'll agree with everything you say. You can preach the, the, the harshest, <laughs> you know, most uh, exoriating lesson about fellowship. As long as you don't name anybody's names. Soon as you give the name of a gospel preacher who teaches error on fellowship, well, now you have a problem. Now, you know, you're not very clear. You're not a very good speaker. It's hard to understand you. Uh-huh, sure. <laughs> I've been hearing that for years. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I'm not a very good preacher, but it's not because I'm unclear. <laughs> That's not the problem. You have to name names. I was told a story about a fella in the, in a, uh, the 1800s was preaching the gospel. He, came to, he, he was a traveling preacher. He came to a town, a logging town, where the flume you know, ran through town. And he noticed that people in the town had a habit of walking up to the flume somewhere away from the distribution sites and taking logs for their homes to go burn on fire or whatever else. Well, that's not their property. Then he noticed that members of the church were doing it. 
So that Sunday, he preached a lesson on the sin of stealing and just whooped it upside one, you know, up one side and down the other and expected that he was going to have some trouble. But afterwards, they all came up and shook his hand and thanked him for that lesson. And he kind of scratched his head. So the next Sunday, he preached not on thou shalt not steal. He preached thou shalt not steal thy neighbor's logs. <laughs> then he got ran out of town. <laughs> you have to name names. You have to fix responsibility. Right? If you don't do it, nobody gets it. Everything's cool. There's no problem. The gospel is personal. Galatians 3.1, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Who has bewitched you? At that time, Peter was responsible for all of the others falling out. Paul is asking at Galatia, who now is responsible? And if Peter, the apostle, can't bind the law of Moses, who do these guys think they are? Where do they get off talking about this? Can you be any more Jewish than Peter and Paul? How about this in Galatians 4? This one is very poignant. I think we should look at this carefully. Galatians 4, 14 to 17. He said, when I preached the gospel to you at first, my condition was a trial to you, but you didn't scorn or despise me, but to receive me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. What then has become of your blessedness? I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make, good, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. But notice what he said. When he first went down to preach in Galatia, they received him, as he says, as an angel of God, as Christ himself. Which is an interesting comparison to what he said, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach any other gospel. But he said, you receive me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus I bear testimony you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. What are we saying? Man, they really loved him. They loved him. They respected him. They revered him. They, they received him there. But as he perceives that they're walking in the binding of the law of Moses and he rebukes them for it, he says, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? What does it mean? It means they have changed. The way that they treat Paul personally is different now. He used to be accepted. He used to be good with them. We used to know him and be friends, and be friendly when he came. We would shake his hand. We'd walk over to make sure and say hi, but not anymore. Why? Because of influence. Right? Because of influence. The change in their personal reception of Paul reflects a change in their stance on the truth. Don't you see that? Because people think that fellowship is nothing more than friendship. If we like him, he's okay. If we get along, we're friends, we're buddies, that means we're in fellowship. That's what people think. Friendship, fellowship is not biblical, though. Fellowship isn't about getting along and being friends. Fellowship means we share in something. There's something common to us in that thing. No bones about it. 
is the faith in Christ Jesus. We may have nothing else in common. We may not be from the same nation, from the same background, from the same class of people. But what we have in common is the faith in Christ Jesus. That's our fellowship. That's the basis of fellowship. It's not about friendship. But their change in how they treated him personally, their change, the change of the personal reception of him, it reflects a change in their stance and the doctrine. That's what's happening. And he knows it, and they know it. Who's your friend and who's your enemy? And who is a hypocrite? Galatians 4, at verse 21, he said, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law of Moses, don't you hear the law of Moses? This verse launches the, this very lengthy rebuke of those who claim to be in Moses' camp. The fact is they're hypocrites. Paul knows the law of Moses better than they do. And he begins to teach from the law and show how that the law itself tells you that it's a means to an end. Remember in chapter 1, 14, verse 14, he said, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Yeah, he advanced beyond many. He was esteemed by that whole nation everywhere they went and landed on the shores, they invited that guy to speak in the synagogue. You know, this reaches its final conclusion in Galatians 6.3, those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. They're not keeping it. When we say you, are, you desire to be under the law, don't you hear what the law says? They're the hypocrites. They're the hypocrites. Galatians 5.4 is another question about who. He said to them, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law of Moses. You have fallen away from grace. Because this is a question of which law is final. Is the law of Christ final or is the law of Moses final? Which is the one that finishes you off? The verse is rebuking those who want Moses to finish out the faith that is in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying in the whole letter. It's, you, you have started by the Spirit. You have started by faith. Will you be finished off by the flesh? Isn't your, your repentance, your faith in God, your resurrection in the Spirit, this is somehow going to be helped by circumcision of the flesh? No, it's not. That's irrelevant. This illustration that he's, that he's giving is turning circumcision around from what they think it is. They think you have to be circumcised to be saved. He said, if you're being circumcised in order to be saved, you're being cut away from Christ. You think you're cutting away the world from yourself, but no, you're cutting yourself away from Christ. Faith in Moses is finished out by faith in Christ. Christ is the end intended by the law, not the other way around. Where you believe and obey Christ, and now you're ready to become a Jew. <laughs> and, and in high school, I had an Israeli friend. His father was in town doing some business in Fort Worth with General Dynamics. I'm sure it was innocuous. And uh, I laugh because we... <laughs> we, we Walked by a piece, uh, a piece of art where they had a sword mounted on the wall. And uh, he stopped, he hit me in the chest and stopped me and grabbed the sword and said, Come, Luis, we make you Jew. <laughs> I was like, wow, man, <laughs> you're kind of crazy. But really, and he didn't believe in God. He told me he didn't believe in God. I, he said, you want to know what I think or what? He said, I think that somebody made up a bunch of stories and they work pretty well. I was like, okay, that's what he thought. So when he did that, it reminded me of this, because I'm realizing, yeah, you know, there is such a thing as just purely human symbolism, human culture that means nothing. In and of itself, it's meaningless. 
The basis of his humor is accurate. <laughs> but it really points out what Paul is saying. That thing, that's not, that doesn't mean what you think it means. Whose law is the final law? Christ's law is the final law. In Galatians 5, 7 through 12, we have this. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Who hindered you? It's not God. It, this persuasion is not from the one who calls you. Reminding us of chapter 1, verse 12, I didn't receive it from man. I received it from a revelation of Jesus Christ. He's the source, the origin. Who hindered you? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Your boasting is not good. Remember the one who is troubling you, whoever he is, is back to chapter 1 and verse 7. There is no other gospel, but there are some who will trouble you and want to distort the gospel. And he said, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? As in, he still allows people to be circumcised, just not, it just has nothing to do with Jesus. It's got nothing to do with faith. It's got nothing to do with salvation. You can be a citizen of Israel if you want to be. But it's like what we read earlier in chapter 4. What has become of your blessedness? Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Why am I still being persecuted if I'm fine with being Jewish? Where is this coming from? What's the source? The call is for the church to discipline those who hold that teaching. And yeah, that's personal, isn't it? And he said, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves, which is the equivalent of saying, let him be accursed. Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And yes, this is literally a reference to the circumcision. They would cut themselves off, be gone. <coughs> Finally, in Galatians 6, you have this record in the 12th verse and the 13th verse. Who are they really? Gets down to it. What is this really? It's Galatians 6, 12 and 13. It's those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Who are they really? They're those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. Those who seek the approval of man, not of God, Galatians 1.10. They're those who would force the church to be circumcised. As opposed to Galatians 2.3, even Titus, who was a Greek, was with me and was not forced to be circumcised. There are those who want not to be persecuted for the cross of Christ, which is chapter 2 and verse 12. Why did Peter do this? Because he feared the circumcision party. The fear of the circumcision. The fear of the persecution. Who are they? They are those who do not themselves keep the law. How can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews, said Paul to Peter in, Act, or in Galatians 2.14. They don't keep it. And Peter confessed we weren't able to keep it. They're those who desire to boast in your flesh. He said in Galatians 2, 15 and 16, We ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners, yet we know a person is justified not by works of the law of Moses, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we too have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law of Moses, because by works of the law of Moses no one will be justified. 
In other words, who are they really? They're those who want you to conform to them. They're those who want to boast to others about your conformity to them. That's what is really happening. And yes, Galatians 1 and 2 is that initial setup for a call to obedience. We must not follow personalities. We must follow God through his word. And the fact is, it always gets personal. You have to name names. You have to sever ties. Why don't people like it? Because it means they're going to have to go back and question things. They're going to have to question ties. I'm not willing to hear, you know, no, 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 right? I don't want to hear that this guy is off because my cousin goes there. And I don't want him to be wrong. Well, whether your cousin goes there or not is immaterial as regards whether or not that's the truth. And our duty to that truth trumps our duty to our family. But in closing, I remind you of 2 John 10 through 11. He said, if anyone comes to you and doesn't bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So if somebody comes, they're at your home where you could receive them. You could be gracious. You could be a host. You could be hospitable. But you know they don't bring the teaching of Christ. They teach error. What are you supposed to do? Do not receive him into your house. Give him no greeting, which is to say, bid, do not bid him Godspeed. Whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Is that going to be taken personally? Yes. The brother that you know shows up in town and wants to visit with you, and you say, no, well, you cannot do that here. We No, we cannot. You're not coming in here. We're not going to go along to get along. He's going to be hurt personally. He's going to take that personally. You don't want to be with me. You won't be around me. You know, what did I do to you? But that's not what it's about. It's about the truth that you hold to, the truth that you stand for, and his soul that needs to be saved just like Peter's was. So yeah, it's personal. Make it personal. Or don't we care about the lost? Are we not about seeking and saving the lost? If you want to save them, you have to have the guts to stand up to them. Yes, the question of who is the real question in Galatians. The only person who is somebody is Jesus Christ. The only person's word who counts for anything is Jesus Christ. That's how this is. The church is no democracy. It is a monarchy. And Jesus is its king. Now, you didn't die for it. I didn't die for it. You didn't pay for it. I didn't pay for it. The Lord did these things. Today, are you a Christian? You can escape these trappings of the world and be something that is good for God. We have water prepared so that you, based on your repentance, can be baptized in the name of Christ, putting to death the old person, leaving behind these old things and these old ways of the world to be resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Pray for forgiveness from God. Let us pray with you and for you too. But think back on these things and see, isn't it so that Paul realizes things? In retrospect, he can see it for what it really is. And he's warning us about the power of influence. It can be good, but it can be very bad. And you've got to stand up to it regardless. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, please let your need in the Spirit be known by coming to the front while together we stand and sing.